Excellent. It's, uh, you know, a minute past 11. And uh, while participants continue, continue to join us, I want to just very briefly kick off uh, this webinar. It's all about driving growth, right? And this is a major challenge for many companies other than a fortunate few who might just happen to be in the right place at the right time or were actually ready for something like this. Uh, so I'm Gautam Chalagala. I'm a professor of strategy and marketing here at IMD Lausanne. And I'm delighted that my colleague, uh, Mishek, uh, who's, I'll, I'll turn over the webinar to him shortly. He and I will be doing this uh, together. Uh, Mishek will be doing the first half, and then I will uh, do the second half. And essentially what we're going to do is really look at two ways in which companies can try and drive growth. And uh, you know, Mishek is going to give one perspective and I'm going to give the second perspective. So over to you, Mishak. Thank you so much. So just making sure you guys can see me. Uh, my name is Mishak Puskorski. As you can tell from my name, I'm originally Polish, although I spent most of my life in the US before coming to IMD about six years ago. Uh, right now, I'm the Dean of IMD Southeast Asia, which is why I am here. Uh, broadcasting to you from Bangkok. So delighted to uh, have you guys with me and delighted to be able to do this with Gautam, who I used to hang out with quite a lot. And for obvious reasons, I'm not seeing uh, Gautam very much. So it's great to be able to collaborate with him on this on this project. So I'm going to see if my slides going forward. Excellent. OK. So uh, you must have noticed, and myself as somebody who's actually running our business in Southeast Asia, Right now, when we are in the times of crisis, really the only thing that matters is cash, cash conservation and making sure that you have a fair amount of cash to survive this crisis. So when that happens, what we're seeing in our research, what we're seeing when we're talking to our clients is that customers will only spend on essentials, right? And that obviously has humongous implications for anybody's ability to grow in the system. If anything, uh, everybody is experiencing revenue declines, and that's basically because everybody is trying to conserve as much cash as possible. But it is possible to grow. It is possible to grow, but in order for you to grow, you have to be solving customers' immediate problems. And we've noticed this in our IMD's business. We're noticing it with all the clients that we are uh, talking to and doing research on is if there is an immediate solution to a problem, they will always find cash for that, right? So, so, so unfortunately, what this means is all the old cliches that you've heard in a business school for the previous, I don't know, 25 years around customer centricity, putting the customer at the center of everything that you do and falling in love with your customer's problem, which is probably as cliche as it ever gets, unfortunately, it becomes even more important that, uh, that ever before, right? And in some ways breaks our hearts that we're sort of taking you to some very, very basic ideas that uh, we have advocated for a very long time. But in some ways, it's not surprising, right? I mean, our businesses are now operating at those sort of very, very basic principles, nothing sophisticated, it's just solving the basic issues. So we need uh, to basically turn to our customers and we need to put them at the center of everything to do. And we really need to focus on the fundamental problems that we they're facing and solve them right away. So as Ausgautam already suggested, we want to do two things. We want to suggest two different ways in which you can actually put customers at the center. So even though I sort of, you know, tongue in cheek criticized us of being a little bit old fashioned, the two mechanisms that we're going to show to you are not old fashioned. They will be truly, truly digital and they'll be taking a lot of data and doing things with the data to really put customers at the center. So whilst the concept of what we're after might be a little bit old fashioned, the way we're going to propose the solution to you, I think is quite new because it leverages everything that is new in digital worlds. So we're going to do two things. Uh, I'm going to start with falling in love with your customer's data. In other words, I'm going to say, what are the some beautiful things that you can do if you take the data that your customers already have and use that data to help solve problems for them? And Gautam is going to do something that's even more creative. He's going to say, listen, 
you, inside of your own company, you have a lot of fascinating data. And if you can only take that data and actually give it to your customers, surface it and make it easy for them to do business with you, uh, you're going to be actually on your path to growth. I'm going to give you two, maybe three case studies um, of uh, two uh, different companies who have actually done the fall in love with your customer's data. And Gautam is going to give you one very extensive case study of a company that took its own data and gave it, gave it to the customers and created substantial growth. So let's start with the uh, first example here on how do you get, uh, if you, how do you fall in love with your customer's data? So I'm going to start with a company that is very dear to my heart, a company that I work uh, quite a lot with, uh, Bayer. Uh, and one of the divisions of Bayer is in this really, really interesting situation uh, that they're selling a product that essentially at its core is a commodity, right? So seeds are a commodity. Of course, you can make seeds less of a commodity or fertilizers less of a commodity. But at the end of the day, they end up being fairly undifferentiated products. And as a consequence, when you're actually selling somebody um, these seeds or fertilizers, you're really not solving their problems. You're selling them a product, but really at the end of the day, what you should be doing is selling them yield or selling them advice on how to use this product to maximize that yield. And that obviously has been extremely, extremely difficult for these companies to do, because let's face it, they've been sort of stuck in this universe of building big research functions that improve the product, but they never really sort of reached out to the customer. So what are the, uh, what are the possibilities to really fall in love with your uh, customer's problems? So to do that, I want to play you a very short video, and I am always very, very scared of streaming a video to over 350 of you over Zoom. So what I'm going to do instead is I'm going to ask my producer on the other side uh, to drop in the chat box a link to YouTube, which will show you a video. Uh, and I encourage all of you to click on that video. So all of you, you guys will, 350 of you will go to YouTube to watch a very short clip. Feel free to do that. If for some reason you are behind a firewall that prevents you from going to YouTube, our producer should be also dropping a link to our internal IMD platform. IMD is considered usually less of a threat to firewalls, so you should be able to download that. Uh, but th there might be a little bit of a lag uh, in which you uh, might not be able to see this video for about 10, 15 seconds before it loads. So I'll let you watch this video. It'll take about um, two minutes, two and a half minutes. Uh, this is the video from Bayer's uh, division of, uh, from Crop Science. It's a good video. These guys, these guys are uh, masters at marketing. That, that, that is for sure. I see quite a few of you guys are done. Excellent news. Very good. All right. Let me see if I can. So what have these guys done? What is the fundamental thing that these guys have done? Well, as you can see from the video, they have over-invested in building a variety of sensors. So from the American government, they have taken a very extensive data set that documents uh, the quality of soil, for that basically documents almost every inch of American soil for agriculture. To, on top of that, they've used a number of sensors from uh, the various machines that you can see on the, on, the, on the field. You've seen drones, you've seen imagery from satellites, you have seen uh, little um, sensors that are in the ground that monitor nitrogen and then monitor humidity and moisture and all these parameters that are critical to figuring out how things are growing. And on top of that, there is also uh, videos for scouting. So it tells you when you might be attacked by, uh, by some uh, bugs that are trying to eat your corn. And all of that information then gets uh, given to you with a recommendation on the base of ad analytics. And the analytics here is quite interesting in the sense that you're basically uh, running a number of simulations and what if scenarios that allow you to figure out what would happen to your yield if you're going to put some nitrogen here? What would happen to your yield if you're going to water a particular uh, plant? And I hope you sort of noticed from the short um, picture over here that I put up uh, that shows you that actually some of these, rec oops, excuse me, uh, went a little bit, Wrong one, uh, just one second. Um, that they basically show you the different parts 
of your of your field we should uh, get different parts of recommendations so it is uh, in many ways precision agriculture that allows them to really give you recommendations at a very particular point uh, uh, on the ground right given what that advice uh, is is doing to the field of course you can measure the outcome of that advice and that then you can sort of do a comparison between what you predicted was going to happen with the yield and what the real yield was. And you then take that as a data and you sort of throw it in back to you into your model to continually improve your model. Unfortunately, in this field, uh, the speed with which you learn is quite slow because in most of the uh, uh, northern hemisphere, we only have one cycle when we're measuring yield. In some of the southern hemispheres uh, or in the, around the equator, you may be willing to uh, able to learn a little bit faster. So those guys are l learning faster there, but the speed of learning is, of course, not as fast. And so what have they gotten out of this? What they have gotten out of this is the ability to actually fundamentally change the, uh, the business model, right? Not only are they helping now their customers to increase the yield by providing the advisory services. So to me, that sounds like a massive movement from uh, having, uh, you know, selling just products to really putting the fundamental problems that your customers facing at the center of what you do, you're also changing the uh, business model. And many of you guys have already heard about moving towards outcome-based pricing. And here we see an example where the outcome-based pricing is, is uh, really uh, quite possible to implement finally, where those who've been very successful with the advice uh, that they've received from Bayer are paying more, and those of you who haven't uh, had much luck are paying much less. Uh, this has not been implemented at scale. Those guys are still experimenting with this, but the early results uh, seem to be uh, quite promising. So what do we take away from this? We take away from this this basic idea that if you start taking a, um, a data from your customers and really start processing it and giving to them as proper advice, you can do some very interesting things. Let me just give you one more example of how I see this. And this example is also going to be at Bayer, at which point I'll stop and I'll let you, Gautam, uh, ask some questions because I see some wonderful uh, questions being uh, showing up. So, uh, so, so I'll ask you, I'll ask you to uh, uh, give them uh, to me. It'll be easier probably if you ask them. But I want to move you to a slightly sort of more complicated place where, again, uh, we have a pharma company. And let's say, let's face it, in the pharma world, world, uh, you are selling a product, which is most of the time patented, and you're selling it when the, the, the customers, or in this case patients, are sick, right? So, so you have this sort of very blunt mechanism of figuring out when somebody needs help, and they, they go to the doctor, and you administer a pill. But at the end of the day, I mean, and COVID example is perhaps the best example of this, people really don't want to get the cure only when they're sick. They would probably prefer to get some sort of cure in anticipation of being sick when their sickness is just about ready to develop. But of course, that is very hard to figure out because diagnoses are still made in a very, very analog way. So what if there was a better way to actually do this? And what about the, what about, what there was a better way to actually provide people with something that they want, which is not falling sick in the first place? It would be a massive opportunity for you to grow. Well, actually, uh, if you see what's happening in the pharma industry, um, those pharma companies that are being very smart about their growth are actually investing quite heavily and again, collecting the data that customers are already providing, putting tremendous amount of analytics behind it, and then giving advice, in this case, uh, diagnose, the proper diagnosis, so people can avoid being sick in the first place. And there's numerous examples of this sort of loop that, that you've seen uh, here and previously in, in, in the example of uh, crop sciences. Uh, one uh, association that I really like is, is one of looking at chest scans, right? So we have vast numbers of chest scans, and we have vast numbers of scans of human body, uh, and those scans are right now interpreted manually by, by, by radiologists. Um, what can you do with that? Well, you can apply fairly basic AI, so, so fairly, fairly basic classification problem uh, in AI to basically say, if these people with these sorts of scans are going to uh, develop a particular disease or are already at risk of, of developing a particular disease, and those other people are not. Incidentally, what you're seeing here is scans of um, 
uh, heart and uh, around heart area, you can also do a very equivalent scans of chest, which in the COVID-19 world uh, are quite important and, 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 and Bayer is actually working quite aggressively at figuring out how can they help people who are suffering from COVID or could potentially be suffering from COVID and, and helping them out by scanning uh, thousands and thousands of, of, uh, scan, of these uh, chest scans to help people out. So what do you do with this? You basically uh, uh, develop on the, on the basis of scanning this an ability to uh, figure out who is likely already sick or who will develop uh, sickness. This one is for CTEF. Um, since CTEF is a uh, fairly rare disease, uh, is chronic, okay, I always have to pause for a second to pronounce this properly, chronic thrombembolic pulmonary hypertension. Please do not get it. It is a very rare disease, but when you get it, it's really difficult to survive this disease. And, and so early detection here is absolutely central. And so it happens that Bayer uh, actually does have the right a medicine to, to which will help you, which administer if administered early enough. Of course, because of lacking diagnosis, they were not able to grow the market for this. And now basically what they're doing is they're using the customer's data, massive amounts of data to learn out of that uh, in order to figure out who is uh, at risk of developing this problem and who's not and helping us out. So Gautam, maybe you can... Uh, yeah. Uh, thank help you, Vishak. Uh, very help nice here. examples. And uh, feel free to put some additional questions in the chat and I'll forward them to Vishak. But mm -hmm. uh, here's one. Um, I think uh, Ivan was raising is this solution selling, collaborative selling. And uh, Vishak, do you have a point of view on this one? Yeah, so, so, so we actually, Gautam and I had a conversation about this. Uh, how is this different from, uh, from solution selling? Because we have so seen solution selling in the past, right? In some ways, it's fundamentally uh, nothing that we haven't seen. But w I think what's very, very different here is the importance of getting first-hand data from the customers and getting first-hand data in real time. So, so, so uh, the example, the first example that I gave of, of, of Bayer's um, uh, crop science division, right? What I find really fascinating about it is, you know, a solution selling would be, we come to your field, we say, do this and we're done and we've never see you again. Here, we're actually holding your hand in real time, uh, telling you, listen, uh, here's what you need to do today in order to make sure that you have maximum yield, right? So if, 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 we, uh, if, if we can settle for real-time continuous solution selling, uh, then, then it becomes solution selling. But I think sort of the, the, the critical component here is, you know, we are with you at all times. We evolve, the situation is evolving and we're evolving with you. Whereas in the past, I think that the solution selling has been really much more of, here is a solution, we think it's sort of tailored to you and please, uh, Go, uh, go, go, go off and do your thing, right? And and Robert's saying we are part of the solution. You're a partner, absolutely. And in some ways, going back to Robert's point, right? One of the interesting things that this is also um, uh, picking up the system on is this. So, sort of how is the customer actually re reacting to the advice? Because sometimes the customer is immediately reacting to the advice and implementing it. In some ways, uh, very often the customer is not doing this, and so the system is also learning about the biases that humans are introducing into this uh, ecosystem. Nabil is asking about data privacy. Uh, how do you build a strategy around it, particularly as legislation around data can vary worldwide? And so that's super interesting, right? Because in some ways, the reason why I chose the two examples examples that I gave you uh, are exactly to, to sort of elicit questions of privacy, right? Uh, it's a little bit easier because uh, we don't accord plans the same privacy rights that we uh, accord individuals. So in the, in the, in the uh, crop science example, it was reasonably easy to see why the farmer did not really care much about the data being shared. But of course, the farmer is very sensitive about these data being shared competitively with others. So, so, so there is still a concern around that. And here, uh, I think that the, the, the sort of um, way out of these uh, considerations is really the amount of value that you're uh, giving back. We notice every time people are complaining about data privacy, it's always about you taking my data, I don't have control over it, you're doing something with it, 
and I don't know what it is, it can be used against me, right? But to the extent that we're actually able to take this data and create substantial amount of value that we then hand over to the customer and say, as a consequence of giving me this data, I am now able to make you more efficient, make you more effective, save money or guarantee you highest yields, um, obviously this gets um, uh, much, much easier. When you move to the uh, world like Bayer's uh, 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 sort of Palmer New Solutions, right, then it becomes a little bit more difficult, right, because you have actually real human beings who are affected uh, by this, and if the data gets disclosed, then we have some, some real issues. So definitely here you need to be particularly careful around analytics. So some of the most recent advancements now in collaborative analytics are absolutely critical to us being able to extract these data and insights without actually uh, maintain, uh, whilst maintaining uh, individual rights to, to, to private health information. So super, super um, important question there. Uh, so can mm -hmm. B2C companies do something big and change the game? Like, you know, uh, these were two excellent examples uh, but mostly B two B. But could B two C companies do? Like mm -hmm. I know you, you've done a lot of uh, research in this area and have worked and studied some of these companies. Perhaps mm -hmm. one quick example yeah, there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, I, I, I hate. I, I don't want to come across as sidestepping the question. But but uh, Nikhil, if if I can just sort of point out one thing to you, it's like what's really interesting is that all of the examples that I have pointed out to you make the companies that were originally B2B actually B2C, right? So so it, in many ways forces all of these companies become B2C. Like in, in nowhere beforehand did Crop uh, ever see the end customer and now they're seeing it. So this is a, an example of a company that's becoming B2B to C. It, to be honest with you, in the B2C example, it's even easier uh, to, um, uh, to, to, to think how you can provide value to the, to the consumers. I mean, uh, you know, uh, one, one thing that comes to my mind immediately, uh, and, and I just want to sort of stay in, in the realm of healthcare, just so that we don't jump out of, from this too far, right? The number of platforms that we're seeing right now that are basically aggregating uh, human uh, health information and helping humans with their information to give them real value. I mean, the one that comes to my mind uh, recently is OneDrop. I, if you're not familiar with it, I really recommend uh, you start uh, looking at this. It's, it's a, a diabetes management system uh, that both has a sensor and collects data from you, but it also connects you with others who are affected with the same disease in the same way like you would do on patients like me, and then uh, gives you advice, not only how to maintain your sugar levels, but also allows you to uh, maintain an overarching sort of good health, right? Because uh, very often with diabetes, there's a lot of comorbid conditions that you have to take care of. So, so, so in, in some ways, it's easier for B2C uh, to, to, to give uh, that sort of uh, advice. Uh, because again, customers are not aware of their data. You see also this with, uh, I think what this is what uh, you are referring to, I uh, spend a lot of time thinking about companies that are using the kind of Fitbit information about your health and so forth. So I think, again, here we're seeing numerous examples of companies that are collecting data about us and then giving us advice on what to do, right? Uh, what else do we say? Is this type of entire sales approach economically feasible for large customers? Interesting question from Vanessa. Thank you. Uh, so, so it actually happens. So it happens that most of the time when these uh, systems get introduced, uh, the, the the ones that uh, are the, the kinds of customers that are most interested in that are actually large customers, and, and that's because they already have so much data. They've already, uh, you know, have a lot of volume. So, you know, the initial investments that they have to make in collecting these data get amortized over more sales, and so they're more likely to accept this. So, one of the issues that I think uh, Bayer is, is facing right now with their um, uh, crop science is actually getting the small farmers to adopt the sensors and 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 use them for additional uh, efficiency gains and which would be huge for them, right? But they need to start investing uh, in them. So we have Kautam, a what else do you Atif see? has been raising his hand as has Siddhant. Oh. Maybe we end with them, uh, Mishak. Uh, Atif, so can you help? Can you help me out? Sorry, which which one? Which one did you have in mind? One is Atif had his hand up. 
and I don't think, uh, uh, you know. So think- Atif, Atif, I see real-time solution selling is predominantly focused on capturing problems before it becomes reality. Is that is that the one you're talking to, right? Yeah. I, I yeah. think he had his hand up yeah. for yeah, awesome, awesome. Um, I think so, right? I mean, so so there's two ways of thinking about uh, this, right? And it goes back to the distinction between descriptive analytics, predictive analytics, and prescriptive analytics. And Atif's uh, sort of uh, uh, question is, you know, do you see most of this value add through predictive analytics? What will happen, right? And that's definitely true. I mean, the, the example that I gave you on around... Um, healthcare and, and uh, developing pulmonary embolisms is definitely in that realm. But I think the first example that I gave you, which is much, much more around uh, sort of growing and yield and so forth, I would put that in the world of prescriptive analytics, which is what should happen, right? And that system is actually based on these simulations that basically create a lot of what ifs and give you the optimal course of action. So I do think that that's actually a critical component, which is sort of, I think, in many ways, at the core of, of putting your customers' problems at heart. What, what, what this approach really requires you to do is to really, it requires you to develop a very proper model of how you, the economics of your customers' uh, functions and works and run simulations on that model of your customers' economics, right? And then and only then can you start thinking about how you're going to give good advice to the customer to power their business, right? So, so data is important, but the analytical component is, is equally as important for predictive purposes. Um, the Bogdan said, I didn't get the part where you can charge successful more with higher price. Could you expand on this, please? Right. So, so, so there's so at least two, uh, let me just answer this in Gautam and I'll hand over to you, right? Because I think this is, this is the important part about how you actually capture value out of this. So there's two components out of this, right? There is the sort of the general component of if you're going to get advice to people, the yields will go down, the, the, the go up, and then you'll be able to charge more for that advice. And then there's a second component when you can actually start uh, charging people differently, right? So what you basically do is you say, look, uh, I'm gonna, uh, you're gonna guarantee me that you're gonna pay me, I don't know, 10 cents, and then you're gonna pay me one additional cent on every additional bushel or every additional ton of output that you're going to, uh, to, to, to grow, right? So then what happens is that the most efficient producers, right, because they're so effective with the advice that you've given them, will end up paying more and the ones who are um, uh, not so effective will end up paying less. And what that does is that it creates a perfect price discrimination between the really efe- efficient ones who end up paying more and the ones who uh, end up paying less will be the less efficient ones. And so you will sort of nicely cover uh, the different willingness to pay across different parts of market with this pricing. So if you want, Bogdan, feel free to email me uh, about this and, and I'll be more than happy to send you some additional information on, on how you execute uh, on this because I think it's a great way of actually uh, creating value out of this system. So Gautam, maybe I should uh, step back and let you go to the second component of falling in love, uh, making your customers fall in love with your uh, data that you have. So what I'm going to do is just hand, stop my remote control. There you go. It's back to you. Excellent. Uh, thank you so much, Mishak, and for the conversation. I think that was uh, just as important to you know give the perspective, give them a chance to ask questions. And I'm going to take a slightly different perspective, but it's all again around data analytics at the heart and how companies can use this to actually drive growth, right? And in a way, what Mishek and I are saying is, you know, you can actually take information that's out there, you know, whether it's internal or external and leverage it. And so I'm going to call, you know, what I'm going to talk about is very non-conventional way of driving growth. Meaning in this particular case that I'm going to show, you're not really introducing new products or services, but by just leveraging what you have, you actually drive growth among customers. And I'm going to do this uh, just with one case study, uh, a company that um, 
uh, is a professional services firm. And the nice thing about professional services firm is most of us at one time or the other have either you know, come in contact with them. You might be using their services, whether it's the strategy consulting firms or if it is, a, a, you know, big four type of a consulting firm, or you might be working with, you know, the more boutique firms, or you might have worked for one of them, right? So I'm going to highlight the case of a company called SMA. I would say this is a boutique consulting firm. They're based in uh, Irvine, California, and uh, they've been there from 1982. Now, one of the interesting things about SMA is this is a company that is an original gig firm. You know, I mean, this was literally the first professional services company that experimented with this kind of a platform model. You know, today we look at platforms have become so common, right? The Ubers, the Airbnbs of the world. So these guys said, I'm not going to hire these employees. I'm actually going to create a walled garden of talent. So it's not anybody could become a consultant. They were very stringent in terms of who they brought in. Uh, but it was really uh, the first gig firm. And they do work across many different areas. You, you can see that on the slide. Typical management consulting, but very strong with government work, uh, very strong in doing things like proposal writing for very, very complex projects, uh, defense projects, and helping with very complex program management. You know, when there are many, many, many different moving parts uh, for these uh, big infrastructure or missile development or whatever, right? Lots of complexity. And these guys have been very good, exceptional is in fact what I would say. So for example, if you look at their win rates, it's like 83%, 89%, 76%. And this is all around, you know, developing proposals and helping with the execution. Uh, it's interesting, really. The PWCs and Deloitte and all often come to this company to say, hey, we are going to work bid on this super complex project and you help us with the entire proposal uh, development. And so very talented in terms of the impact they've been having uh, on their client. Uh, by one count, they said, you know, they have helped their clients win. Uh, like the PWCs to maybe it's a Dell who wants to do a government project, Boeing, uh, win like over 400 billion in business. You know, and so this is a company with 600 consultants to have that kind of impact is quite remarkable. But what this company was facing, and this is where I think some of the lessons uh, that we can draw in from today's context, uh, this happened before COVID, but the context is very interesting and important because this company went into a deep crisis. They overextended themselves, not in terms of the quality of who they were bringing in, but made some bad acquisitions, etc. Uh, founder wanted to sell out, and so they went into a very deep financial crisis. So there were some growth problems as well as a financial crisis. They had 70 million in debt, uh, lots of restructuring. And so as a result, what they needed to do was they needed to reduce their cost base by about 50%. So imagine slow growing, uh, slow growth, and at the same time, they needed to cut costs by about 50%. And so this is where some of the parallels to today's world come in. This is a company in crisis, and now they're trying to figure out, uh, what do I do? On top of that, one of the things that was going on is many of their clients had started developing these capabilities internally. So salespeople would come back and say, hey, it's commoditization in the market. So most of the discussions within the company were all around pricing, you know, weekly conversations on, okay, what deals do we have? And uh, what projects are we bidding on? And what's the price? And how much do you think the uh, customer or client can do it themselves? And therefore, they would come up with, uh, you know, how do they price match and so on. So that was kind of the situation they were in, you know, very difficult, quite brutal. And they had to do this cost take up, right? Reduce cost by about 50%. And, uh, but to do that, what it meant is I can't just take costs out and operate the same way. I need to rethink my processes fundamentally. And if you think about a professional service firm, you know, they have basically three major processes. They're more than that, but three major ones, right? If you're a professional services firm, you have to attract the right type of talent. 
So there's a whole talent acquisition and development process. So they started rethinking that whole process. Then the second one is, of course, around client engagement and relationship building. Okay, that's the second process. And then the third process is around project staffing and you know monitoring and so on of uh, of projects. Uh, you know, uh, putting the right consultants for the right projects and so on. So I'm only going to highlight one of these processes out here. And you, you can see a typical, you know, what I would call as a project staffing and delivery process, right? Customer has a need or a client has a need and they say, hey, I want some help. So then typically the professional services firm will come, they will scope the project, then they'll identify some uh, consultants for it. Often they will bring in, uh, you know, they also show, you know, some resumes to the client and say, here's the team we are thinking of. We do that very often in IMD. When somebody says we want executive development, the faculty director will say, well, here's the faculty we could uh, use for this program, for example. Then there's pricing, contracting, then, of course, there's delivery, uh, you know, execution, some monitoring, then invoicing and capturing feedback. Uh, what I want you to do is to very quickly use your chat function here. And I, I can't promise that I can monitor all or I will get everybody. I just want you to think about what challenges do clients encounter? The way I want you to think about this is this is the process that the uh, professional services firm use. I want you to step into your client's shoes if you've hired some of these companies and say, you know, how often are these projects successful? Is it majority of the time they're hugely successful or are they average or are they below average? And, uh, you know, when they're not going so well, why is that the case? And how often does that happen? And where do you see sort of problems uh, along this sort of journey um, uh, happen? So, uh, delivering on time, absolutely. So one is uh, delivery. They don't understand the client needs, totally. So one is delivery. The other is just they don't understand the client needs. Lack of communication, the scope of the project, overpriced contracts, overpricing, um, you know, uh, uncertainty, you said, yeah, uh, lots of comments I can see here, changing needs to, you know, not fully understanding the client's context, requirements, and so on, right? So uh, many, many, many uh, uh, good points here, complexity, uh, and so on. So there's just a lot of different reasons why bad things can happen, right? So, I, you know, if you think about it, uh, a lot of this is to do with, do you have the right consultants on the project, right? If you have the right consultants, if you have the right team, some of these projects with scoping and all necess don't necessarily go away, but if you have a great team, then the chances are you can manage the project a little bit better. Right? The chances are you can manage the project a little bit better, but does the client really know when they uh, do they really have a great team or not? How does the client really know? You sort of share with the client, you know, the team that you're going to be having. And then there's a lot of intransparency in the process, right? They, you don't really know. Uh, you know, uh, what the pricing is, how the customer, how the professional services firm has arrived at the pricing and so on. And these were some of the issues uh, that typically they were facing. Now, if you look at the project staffing process that is typical, you know, a client communicates some needs to the consulting company. They look internally at their database and then they send to the client some resumes. Client looks at the resumes and then the client will say, okay, I'm going to maybe uh, interview some of them or, you know, I trust your judgment. They get the resumes, they select some uh, uh, candidates and then they execute and then, you know, the pro uh, process here begins. But let me, uh, and this whole process actually takes days to be. You know, if it's a complex project, then it can take a lot of time. If it is a simple project, maybe it takes uh, two or three days uh, for this whole process 
uh, to, uh, to happen. Now, I want to ask you, you know, what can a company do to actually turn this process on its head and make things much better? Okay, so here's what this company uh, uh, started uh, thinking. Actually, the CEO uh, was my former colleague. I, I used to work for a strategy consulting company called Monitor Group. And the CEO, he left Monitor and became CEO of this particular company. And what he said is, you know, there are so many things we can learn from the Ubers of the world and the eHarmonies of the world. And if you think about what Uber has done, it's taken a very painful process of getting transportation and radically simplified that process by making it a lot simpler, right? And that's essentially what Uber has done. And if you take what eHarmony has done is, you know, through very clever construction of algorithms and building of profiles, they're actually able to get people to find the right kind of matches so you can have lifelong relationships. In fact, that's their tagline for eHarmony is you can build lifetime relationships when you come to eHarmony. And of course, uh, post-COVID, the, their success has gone up uh, uh, through the roof. So they said, let's actually use the same kinds of principles and bring it into a professional services form. Now, these are companies that have been buying and selling and doing business the same way for decades. And we're going to actually change this process uh, on the head. And so now the question is, how do you do it? Yeah, you've got these companies like Uber and eHarmony for inspiration. But here's the key thing. Uh, how do you do it? Of course, you can construct a system that may be easier, but what data do you provide and what reactions will you get internally and externally, right? Those are the hard questions. So I'm going to just give you, you can put in chat, what data? These guys have said, I'm going to put, and in fact, let me show you. They said, I'm going to now create a system where all, well, all that needs to happen is the client will get uh, access to a new system they developed called uh, Talent on Demand. Okay, client gets complete access to the system. Client then says, inputs the requirements. The system spits out and says, here are consultants that match your needs. And it gives them on a score from 10 to 100% what the matching is. So 100% match or if they're 90%, then they're closer. They say, hey, these would be a better fit. If it's a 10% match, they're not such a good fit. And then what they do is they give, put all these consultant profiles side by side so you can compare on the most important attribute and decide which ones that you want. One click, you just click, 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 and it goes in. That's your team out there. And then the team gets deployed to the client. This whole process takes almost no time. I mean, what used to take days and weeks is now being shortened to minutes at the most, you know, maybe an hour, maybe a two. But here's the key thing. If you're a booking and an Uber, it's very simple, right? You get a star rating and you're done. That's all we look at. I'm just going from here to there. I don't need much more. If I'm a booking, I put some few pictures, I see the ratings, I'm done. But here, you got to be quite careful, right? What type of information do you provide? Uh, you know, you got, I mean, this is the data privacy issues start coming in. What data can I make visible? Otherwise, I could run into all kinds of lawsuits from my employees, or I can have a rebellion. By the way, let me tell you one thing. A big four consulting firm, I won't mention which one, tried this, and their partner said, I don't want to be shopped around like this. Forget it. So they kill this system, right? So if you want to pull this off, you have to be quite thoughtful in terms of what data do I provide and how do I do this? So I'm going to give you maybe a minute to put some uh, comments in here to figure out what, what do I really make available? Okay, and how do I make this available? Uh, so clearly AI is going to play a big role, right? There's no doubt that AI is going to play a very, uh, am I on mute, uh, Bogdan? No. Uh, sorry. No, you're okay. I? We can hear you. 
Oh, okay, good. Because I somebody said couldn't hear the speaker. So, based on past delivery, you got to do some matching. Difficult with homogenized. You know, these are people, right? And these are complex projects. So it's so much harder than what a booking does. Because a property is a property. You get some pictures, and that's it. Nothing changes. For those types of things, things are relatively static. Uber drivers, quite simple. This very different uh, kind of thing, right? It's all about the quality of data, as you're saying. So let me give you, in the interest of time, let me sort of show you what they did. The first thing this company did was they killed the resumes. They said resumes are completely out of date because resumes tend to be kind of static. And resumes do not really have the kind of information uh, that is really useful for somebody to make a decision. I mean, this is what we often do. You know, if we do this at IMD, when clients come to us and say, who's your faculty team? We send them to the website saying, here's the link. And there's a one, one pager. It's kind of, oh, you studied here, you did that. It's okay. It's not so useful, actually, if you think about it. So what these guys did was they said, we're going to kill the resumes. Resumes are passive. But what we want to do is uh, really focus on a few things. One is they said, we want to create very extensive profiles. And we also want to give the opportunity for a consultant to decide what information is available and not available. So they said, we got to go from resumes to deep profiles. And the foundation for a deep profile is your project experience. If you worked on 75 projects, you got to have details on every project, what your role was. So they said, we are going to go to that level of detail, because if we don't do that, you can never really get a uh, good uh, matching done. I think some of you are saying, hey, but you need a relationship manager, you, you don't. This is exactly the type of questions that they had to deal with, right? Uh, does the client really know, but based on the specs, who might be good, what a team might work like, what the chemistry might be? I think very, very good uh, questions uh, that you're raising and I'm going to get to this. So a few things that they did. So one is, and I think this is hard for you to see. Uh, these are deployments and these are project histories. Every consultant can decide what they want to show, what they don't want to show, what projects they worked on, what they didn't work on. And that sort of gets captured in instantly and goes into a resume, a customized resume that looks something like this, right? You can see it out here. This is a very customized kind of a resume that you right? And then you have lots of information on each person, everything from you know, uh, their uh, uh, deployment preferences to employment history, what roles, but most important is their project history. Like I said, if you've done 75 projects, there's details on every single one of these projects. Certifications that you've done, you know, everything uh, that you've done is captured in there and made open to clients. Right? So this was deep internal information. Now you think about what this does. Right? Uh, mm -hmm. You just think about whether your organizations are even close to doing something like this. They also made every single project that was coming into the organization that you know their uh, business development team would bring in. They made it completely transparent on the system to the consultants. Consultants could pick and choose and volunteer whether they want to be on a particular project and what type of projects they want to be on. Most of the time, think about it internally in your organization. How often do you know of all the career opportunities and exciting projects that you could be on? Do you get to choose or do you just get allocated? Right? Fundamentally, they're, chase, uh, they're actually changing you know, where their talent wants to be deployed and what type of projects uh, that they want to work on. So again, the deep project history, what, the, what they did, uh, just another example, every single project was documented. And then for the client, very simple search engine. They can go, you know, uh, this project, maybe I need an electrical engineer. This is the number of days I need them for. 
and so on. Uh, they do that, and then actually you can get side-by-side -side comparisons. It puts the team together, side-by-side -side comparisons, and you can see here a few things. You can see their daily rates. The so rates are completely transparent. So imagine this, right? They're already worried about commoditization, and they said, no, 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 we're going to make the rates completely transparent, all the prices of each consultant. So one consultant may be 250 bucks an hour, another consultant may be only 200 bucks an hour. You can compare, right? The other thing is their availability. You know upfront whether they're 100% available or 75% available, right? Of course, there are things like data accuracy, profiles are ac uh, accurate, well, that's where this uh, uh, company comes in. And they check what your ratings are on each project and what your performance ones, uh, was on each project. That way you're actually communicating uh, actual information. You know, uh, so Some of these rates may seem cheap, but remember, these are a gig economy. So they're only taking a small percentage of this SMA. Most of this is going to the consultant. So if it is 3,000 a day, you know, probably about 2,500 bucks goes to the consultant, 500 bucks goes to SMA, whatever. So do you have quality control? These are the questions. Does a, is this better or worse than how the system works today? Right? And that's really at the heart of it. By the way, you can also do it on mobile apps. Let me just sort of jump to why this might be a very different system. I think you're all bringing up the very legitimate uh, things like, is there a culture match? Well, they actually do a lot of uh, assessment. So all the assessment data, all of that is also captured in here and, uh, and so on. Um, is this legal in countries? I think it's legal in most countries. They're not giving anything that uh, you would not be sharing otherwise. So most of this would be re legal, but uh, there may be countries where it's not, okay? So I'm not sure if it is legal outside the US, but these guys do a hell of a lot of projects in Europe. These guys do a hell of a lot of projects in Europe. I don't know, maybe some countries may allow it, some countries may not allow it, but here's the key thing. I want to just get to the punchline here. Most consulting companies and most organizations believe they're building trust. They're in the trust building business. If I'm actually in a, a bank or whatever, right? Most of the time, what they forget is there are two basic, the two key dimensions of trust. One is credibility. Do you have the expertise and are you reliable? Do you deliver? based on your promises. Most consulting companies saying, yeah, we've got good people and we can do it. Sometimes we are not really sure the quality of the talent. If you take one of the big four firms, they lose 20 to 25% of their employees per year. They're hiring 40 to 50,000 people a year. Do you really know as a, as a client whether you're getting the top talent? You really don't. A lot of times these are people with not enough experience who are coming in, right? So one is we think of trust as expertise and credibility. But the second piece is very important in trust is, are you working in my best interest? And the only way of somebody knows if you're working in my best interest is when you do the following. You, can, you show them that you're not price gouging. They've made all the rates visible. Here are the daily rates, and here are their profiles. Visibility, you can see what your options are. You're not trying to mix teams in ways that suit us because somebody is available and they're sitting on the bench, but we are actually letting you choose. You safeguard information. And third, you're, you're disclosing. You're much more open and transparent. Many companies do pretty well on this left side, partially well if, uh, you know, if you're a large firm deploying in big projects, but most often here, they're not transparent. This is what I would call as 
taking your existing data, being smart about what you make open to your clients. And just by doing this, they haven't changed their products, they haven't changed their people. They've managed to get growth increase of 7%. Is They've deployed this for about one year and 7% increase. Client satisfaction is through the roof. Internally, it wasn't easy, but the people who are staying in the firm are the better ones who say, I have nothing to fear. The more open it is, the better it is for me. Guess what? If you do well in three projects, now that this is all data and information based, you get an automatic rate increase and promotion in this firm. You don't even have to wait till the year end. The talent is happier because they're picking the projects that they want to be on. So, um, you know, it's, it's, uh, it's done well. I wish we had more time to dig into it. Uh, but basically, if you look at the messages, take data that's out there and build models around it. Or you can take your data that is there with you and try to make and build trust models that are meaningful and don't fool yourself you're in the trust business just because you say yeah yeah we want to build trust and we build personal relationships make sure you're working in the client's interest by doing things like this if you do these then you're truly in the trust business so we are at 12 o'clock uh, apologies that we are a little bit over in terms of time uh, any final thoughts or comments Michelle? Uh, no, I think I think this has been a uh, very instructive for me that uh, you can. I, I really like the comment when somebody said it's essentially kind of taking the dating site idea that has been traditionally reserved for external markets and really trying to kind of bring more markets into your own organization and and giving the customers a a chance to look inside of the organization, subject to all the controls, obviously, and 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 those need to be safeguarded. But I really like the interplay of taking data in and out. So super uh, happy that we get a chance to attract so many of you guys and uh, wish we could see you in person. And we really hope that you join us for the next webinar uh, series, which we'll be announcing very shortly. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you all. Take care. Good luck. And stay safe.